Hi, my name is Lexi. Welcome back to my channel. And today I'm going to be talking about blood glucose and the effects on weight loss and health. And uh, I went down a little bit of a deep dive into a rabbit hole the past week. I listened to an interview on the Intermittent Fasting Stories podcast. It was Jen Stevens and Marty Kendall. And Marty Kendall is the person who uh, leads the data-driven fasting group. And so his deal and his kind of mission is to help people learn how to fast around their glucose numbers instead of just picking like a, a window or doing alternate day fasting, which I have no problem with alternate day fasting. I love it. I don't want to stop doing it. Um, so that's not really my purpose in diving into this information. Um, but I think that there's some of it that I will pull out for my own benefit. And I think that it could actually help a lot of people maybe that are watching this video who are kind of stuck, um, who are having a hard time, you know, picking a window that they like, or maybe they don't like alternate day fasting. Um, and his kind of take on it is that he feels like a lot of people when they fast, will be striving to get to this mark, this hour mark, and push themselves too far to where when they open their window, they're just binging and eating all these crappy foods. And I think that is true for some people. Um, I don't think it's true for everyone, and it's, it's not true for me with alternate day fasting. I have found that my appetite correction and the ability to just regulate how much I eat uh, really has a magical effect when I'm alternate day fasting. I do struggle with it when I do a daily window though. So I can definitely see how people who really want to do a daily window um, and are struggling with, with eating too much and also who just don't want to do alternate day fasting for whatever reason. And I know some people do have a binging problem with alternate day fasting. Um, so it's really just comes down to the person, but that's why I wanted to present this information. I really think it's fascinating. Um, and I think it'll help a lot of people who are stuck or who just need to take it maybe a little bit further, a little bit, uh, you know, get a little more, um, specialized in your fasting. So the reason why Marty Kendall even got into all of this in the first place is because his wife is a type 1 diabetic and she and so he was trying to help her regulate her blood sugar. Um, type 1 diabetes is not reversible and you have to take insulin to be able to manage it. Um, my stepmom has it so I have seen firsthand how difficult it is and just the crazy fluctuations that can happen in one day. And there are a lot of factors that will affect your blood sugar when you're a type one diabetic, exercise, stress, sickness. And that's true with normal people, not normal people, sorry, but a non type one diabetic as well. But for type one diabetics, their blood sugar will just go crazy, like up and down in the span of a day or hours. Um, and it can be very dangerous. So he was trying to help her just to kind of normalize the levels a little bit and so he was able to do that and also then he helped himself to lose some weight and now he helps other people to try and dial into their own blood sugars to uh, figure out the best kind of fasting plan for them. Um, it's a lot of information, so I am going to kind of go over it, and I'm going to tell you what I've been doing the last week, that um, my experimentation, but um, it is a lot of information, so I'll link his website below, and you can check it out, and there is just so much information on the website. So yeah, I was super intrigued about all of this, and I do have a glucometer already, so I figured I would just do some experimentation. And what Marty Kendall, so what his suggestion is in a nutshell is that you should test your blood sugar over the span of a few days before you would normally eat and see what that uh, reading is. And then take that over the average over the three days to get your baseline and that's your trigger. So then after that, you're supposed to wait until you get to that trigger point. So say it's like 95. So you would wait until you get below 95 to 
eat. Um, and I know that in other countries, the readings are different. Here in uh, America, we use um, in the hundreds readings, but I know that other people use different calculations. So I'm sorry, I don't know what that translates to. But, um, but basically you take that reading and then you try to only, if you're hungry, you check your blood sugar. And if you are under that trigger, then you go ahead and eat. And if you are not, you either wait or you can, if you're really hungry, he says to go ahead and eat, but just to prioritize um, nutrient dense foods and particularly protein. He's very, very heavily focused on protein per percentage. Um, and, you know, he talks a lot about that and how uh, we actually need more protein than most of us are eating and it's what our body is looking for and so that has a lot to do with our satiety and satisfaction and then the fat and the carbs are just the energy portion which we don't need as much as we think we do and so it's it's a deep dive i'm telling you but it's fascinating because it's something that i have kind of come to know on my own just in observing people who you know, some people are very successful on a higher fat, lower carb diet. Some people are very successful on a higher carb, lower fat diet. Um, the thing that no one is going to be successful on is a high fat, high carb diet. They just are not friends when it comes to weight loss. So we love them. They're delicious. But those are the foods that we have to dial back on if you want to lose weight. So, you know, you know what those are. Pizza, cookies, cake, things like that that combine high fat and high carb. I still eat them. I do. Can I do better? Yes. Um, and it, it just bears mentioning and it bears paying attention to because... The thing is, is that I think that in macros, even if you don't count them, um, there has to be a kind of balance there. So like if you are higher fat, you have to go lower carb. If you are higher carb, you have to go lower fat. Um, you can be somewhere in between there too, which is pretty much what I am, is more of a moderate um, diet overall. So, but you just have to balance those macros uh, to be able to be successful in maintaining your weight. Okay, so I'm going to be looking down at my notes some because I have a lot of information here. But um, so last Saturday, I went out with my family and we had Chinese food. And, you know, Chinese food is so good. But what we had was, you know, like the chow mein and the orange chicken and pot stickers and things like that. We all shared everything. Um, and... So it was definitely high fat, high carb, and not only that, but we finished eating really late. So I finished eating at 8.30, which normally I would probably be done eating by 4 or 5 on a weekday, weekends maybe around 6, sometimes I'll have a treat later on in the night, but certainly I don't usually eat like a full heavy meal that late at night. And the thing, one thing that Marty Kendall talks about too is that um, you do take some readings after you eat, so that's not something he focuses on a lot, but just to kind of notice how certain meals affect you, not only what you're eating, but when you're eating to see if that like spikes your blood sugar more. Um, and I wish I would have thought to test it when I got home, but I didn't. Um, but so I... I woke up Sunday morning after eating late and my blood sugar was 106. So a normal uh, morning like fasting blood sugar should be under 100. So uh, 106 wasn't amazing. It's not like crazy bad, but um, definitely not great. Um, and so, but I wasn't surprised because I had eaten so late the night before. I knew that it was going to be a little higher. Uh, then I fasted all day Sunday, which I don't normally do, but I switched my schedule around this week because I was donating blood on Sunday or Tuesday, and I wanted to, um, I wanted to have been able to eat a couple days before that just to make sure I was hydrated and make sure that I my iron was up, which it ended up not being, which I'll talk about later. But um, anyway, so I fasted on Sunday all day. 
my blood glucose went down to 89 at around noon and it was down to 84 by the end of the day. So that was good. Um, and then Monday morning I was back up to 89. So the interesting thing is that your blood glucose, even if you're fasting, it can go up. Um, and from what I understand, there's just different responses in your body. Basically, if you dip low and you have, you know, your body will pull glucose out of your glycogen stores from your liver. There are other ways that your body can make glucose as well. So just know that like, even though your blood sugar is going down during a fast, it is possible for it to come back up. Before my first meal on Monday, I was at 89, which was pretty good. Um, and actually kind of surprising when I think about it. Um, after all that I had eaten on, um, Saturday night. Uh, but so then throughout the day, I kind of tested a little bit. Every time I'd eat it, it would go up a little, but not too much. I was up to 95, then 99. Um, and I really wanted to kind of push it on these two days that I was testing. So I wanted to eat like higher fat, higher carb things just to see what would happen. So I did eat like some crappy food, um, which I normally wouldn't do as much during the week. But, you know, I had chocolate, I had three Oreos, I had some chicken nuggets, some fries, uh, some watermelon. And surprisingly, I only went up to 105. Um, so it wasn't a big spike. And I stopped eating at four o'clock. And then Tuesday, I had another eat day. This was the day that I donated blood. So Tuesday morning, um, I was still at 100 when I woke up. So again, not a great waking blood sugar number, but I had eaten a lot of carbs and fat the day before. So an another thing to mention that Marty talks about. So he, when you eat a lot of sugar, you would expect a big spike in your glucose. And that is exactly what happens. But the thing about eating fat is that you won't have a high um, spike, but it will stay elevated for longer. So even though you don't have that big jump, it stays up longer. So it really does, it all plays in there. So so anyways, um, Tuesday morning I was at 100. I tested again before eating and I was at 97. Um, again, I ate a lot that day and still no big like spikes. Um, I went up to 106. So my spikes generally seem to be really good. Like after eating, even if I eat fat and carbs, I don't have big spikes. The one exception to that was when I ate a bunch of gummies. So, you know, those are like pure sugar. So I ate some gummies and then my blood sugar went up to 131. And so then the next morning, so the next morning after this eating day, I was still at 102. So again, you want to be under a hundred for fasting blood sugar. Uh, So then Wednesday evening, I was up, t I was down to 76, which was actually surprising that I had gotten down um, that quickly. But um, Thursday morning when I woke up, I was at 89. So again, I it went back up again. Um, and then I exercised and I checked it after I exercised just out of curiosity and I had gone up to 106. So exercise can raise your blood sugar for sure. It pulls it out, which is, it's not a bad thing like to be able to be using that energy. So that's what your body does. It just, it just does what it does. Uh, then I went down to 99 a little later. Um, Thursday after my meal, I was at 111. Um, then 106 at 615, last eight at 345. And then I should mention that Thursday I ate much better and I was focusing on eating a higher protein percentage this day just to kind of see how that would affect things. So Friday morning I was at 98, so better, but a little, I expected it to be a little bit better than that based on how much better I had eaten on Thursday. So I was a little bit surprised about that. And the other thing that was surprising is I vacuumed 
all my whole upstairs on Friday. And then I tested my blood sugar after that and I had shot up to 121. So for me, it seems like exercise and stuff really does shoot up my blood sugar. Not a ton though, I will say, because um, in the data-driven fasting um, protocol, he says that a spike of anything under 30 is okay. So I'm definitely still in that range. Um, and then at 5.15 in the evening, I was at 80. And then this morning, which was Saturday, I was at, I woke up at 82. So I finally had a good waking blood sugar. Um, and so that was encouraging and really did kind of give me a little bit of data to say that that higher protein day that I had on Thursday over the course of the days was helping me out. Okay, so my thoughts and my skepticism on all of this is just that for one, I don't know anyone personally who has done this. I don't know anyone who's done it long term. I don't really know uh, how crazy you have to get into it, but from what I have seen on from people's results, they're having a lot of great results and really loving it. The thing that kind of turns me off or makes me a little nervous is that some of the people, so I did join the, the Data Driven Fasting Facebook group, and some of the people in the group seem to be really gung-ho and really getting a little bit extreme as far as what they're eating and the higher protein and everything. And I did this diet once back, I don't know, 2011, 2010, something like that. It was called the Ideal Protein Diet, and I hated it with a passion. So it was a super low calorie. Um, I, you know, I didn't know a lot about macros back then, but I did look it up, and I think it's something around like 60% protein. It was super low carb, super low fat super low calorie, super unenjoyable, just miserable. I was, I felt starving all the time. I did drop weight really fast, but it was terrible. I would never do that again. Um, I don't think that's what this is, but I do see that a lot of people in the group are really trying to maximize that protein, low fat, low carb thing. So, you know, that's something that really like turns me off because I just don't want to do anything that's too restrictive because I don't think that that's sustainable by any means, but I don't think you have to do it that way. I really don't. Um, Marty does kind of say that you want to work up to like 40% protein. I don't think that that is something I would ever get to. I could see myself being between 20 and 30%. Um, and you know, working up to that point. I did watch another or listen to another podcast that I absolutely loved. And it was with Dr. Ted Naiman and um, on the Diet Doctor podcast. So I will link that below as well. But, um, but he's talking about, you know, just kind of making gradual changes and really the reason behind why protein is so important. And um, I encourage you to listen to that because it really did opened my eyes and I loved his like uh, reasonable approach to it. And in the end, I think that optimizing nutrition and the data-driven fasting is very personalized and there's no like actual restrictions on it. He does provide a lot of recipes and, um, you know, ways of eating. And the cool thing is, is that he has plans for like any style of eating that you possibly could be doing. Like there's keto and vegan and paleo and well, I think they're working on paleo, but there's a lot of different plans de depending on how you like to eat. So I really think that it could work for a lot of people. Um, I also, I just think that the whole point is that your blood sugar readings aren't going to lie, even though there is some variation there. Like I said, after I would exercise and stuff, it would shoot up. So I think that you have to take all of that into account. But in the end, your, your, your numbers should be like in a good range and you shouldn't be having these big spikes. So I think it really is an interesting and really important thing to pay attention to just because of how important our blood sugar is in our overall health and, you know, insulin response and insulin resistance and how much those things are linked to different diseases. So, um, so yeah, I guess in summary, I would say that if you are struggling and maybe 
or have hit a wall in your fasting, that this is something to look into. And actually, if you so if you join the challenge, there's a lot of information that's there for free and you can join the the main Facebook group for free. Um, but then there's like a 30 day challenge where you get an app and you get, you know, meal plans and just it's more specialized. So if you do that right now, it's only $37 for the month. I think the most expensive thing would be, you know, the test strips because those actually do add up. Um, I think for me, I looked around for 200 strips, which is what he said you would need about 200 test strips for the 30 days. Um, that's about $50. So yeah, so you're looking at, you know, if you have to buy a glucometer too, you know, you can get one for like 20 bucks. So you're looking at about like a little bit over a hundred dollar investment for the 30 day trial. But I really think that that's a good deal for all of the data and information that you would collect. So yeah, I'm not all about making things too restrictive or too crazy, but I just feel like this kind of information could be really valuable. So I wanted to share it with you. It was a, it was definitely a rabbit hole that I fell into. And um, I hope that it helps somebody out there. And if you have any experience with this, please let me know because I'm really interested to hear people's actual experiences. Oh, and real quick, I just wanted to mention that when I went to go donate blood on Tuesday, my iron was really low. It was right at the borderline. Actually, she had to prick my finger, my other finger to get it to like the right number. So I donated blood and then I went into my regular fast after that. And that was a mistake. So don't do that. If you, if you have a uh, low iron and you donate blood, don't go into a fast because I think I depleted my iron way too much and I ended up over the next few days having like heart palpitations and lightheadedness which is a sign of low iron and I ended up having to take an iron pill uh, yesterday so I feel a lot better now but it was kind of freaking me out for a while there so um, don't do that learn from my mistakes and make sure that you Keep your iron up if you uh, are donating blood, and if it's low, do not go into a fast. So, um, but live and learn, and that's what I had to share with you about that. Um, so, yeah, take care, guys, and thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Bye bye.